so damn cock strong especially when she was on them drugs that her nickname they would call her the mutant and um child this is where it gets a little crazy the channel happy mother's day i'm filming this on mother's day and you should see this tonight but i'm also getting ready to go to brunch so maybe maybe not but happy mother's day anyway but yeah happy mother's day we're gonna hop right in because i got somewhere to go we we can't lollygag okay we really gotta get into it and get the business clear so i can go to brunch i'm gonna go ahead and slick my hair down <laughs> while we're here do i have a scarf in here but we are in Puyallup, Washington for today's case. Have we ever been to Washington? Probably not in a minute because I don't remember. Puyallup. That's the name of the town. P-U-Y-A-L-L-U-P. Puyallup. <laughs> it's about 40 minutes outside of Seattle. It's one of the smaller cities right outside of Tacoma. And it's beautiful. Y'all know Washington has like the prettiest mountain views. Even though everybody I've ever known that lived in Washington, well, I guess compared to like sunny Louisiana, has wanted to kill themselves, child. I know a couple people who were stationed in Washington and baby, they did not have a time. But maybe compared to Louisiana, it's, it's just a lot of a difference. I'll be having to swoop back my baby hair wearing my hair like this so I don't look like I play in the WNBA. Not that that's anything wrong with that. I just, that's not my aesthetic. Especially with the outfit I'm wearing today, I don't want to give Bruno Mars. And it is August 31st, 2001, when police are called to do a welfare check on Dana Lasowski. Miss Dana Laskowski was nannying and babysitting for a family who could not get her on the phone and they knew that Dana didn't have a lot of family and people who would, you know, be checking on her every day. So they went ahead and called the police because they felt like her missing work was just absolutely out of the ordinary. She would never do that. So she was supposed to be at work at 8 a.m. She hadn't shown up. And by 11 a.m. the same day, police were at her door. They knock, knock, knocked on the front door, but nobody answered. So they went around to the back door and the back door was open, like open, like I can see into your house open, okay? So the back door led them into the kitchen. They made their way into the kitchen, into the living room. And they shockingly find Miss Dana deceased on her living room sofa. And there was obvious signs of foul play. Miss Dana was found in a really weird position on the couch. One of her arms was like behind her, like maybe somebody had her pent behind her back and her body was twisted in a really weird position and she had been obviously strangled and it looks like somebody had her in like a maybe like weird wrestling position and strangled her at the same time or like maybe somebody was on top of her like they found her laying on the couch and they pinned her down on the couch and strangled her but her body was left in a really weird position and she also had some like scuffing on her knees. There was obviously signs of a struggle. They believe she had been deceased just for a few hours that she had died sometime the day before or the night before. It hadn't been a full 24 hours yet. They continue about the house looking for evidence. Um, Dana's basement window was broken, but the home had also seemingly been ransacked. Like drawers pulled open, closets open, but they couldn't see where anybody took anything. Maybe somebody was looking for something, but there was no obvious signs of anything being missing. And so they wrap everything up at the crime scene and start looking into who Miss Dana was. At the time of her passing, she was a 36 year old mother to three. She was divorced and she and her ex-husband had triplets after a few years of not being able to conceive. And even after having three of her own, she still loved kids, loved babysitting, loved being around children. So after obviously fertility treatment, she had triplets. 
And I can't imagine what that's like. Nobody is more excited to be pregnant than somebody who's been trying for a long time. And I just think that's so unfair. Like if I could rub some of my fertility off onto people trying to conceive, I would give it to you gladly, gladly, gladly. Like I I'm done with it. You can have it. So Miss Dana spent a lot of time with her kids as well as her niece, Amanda, who was college age that she could spend time with. Can you stop yelling? He's yelling his ABCs. I guess that's a good thing. Ciao. But Dana would let Amanda have her friends over. You know, stuff like that. So she hung out a lot there as well. Miss Dana and her husband, the father of the triplets, had just recently divorced in 2001. I'm sorry if I'm talking fast. I'm trying to talk in between him yelling the alphabet. Sorry. And when they reach out to her ex-husband, Sam, they cannot get a hold of him. And it was his time with the kids. That's where the kids were at this time. Obviously, him having the kids and not answering the phone is alarming to detectives. Okay, my brows was looking a mess at first, but they came out. They came out. They pulled through. I thought I was going to have to start over my face. But when they catch up to Sam, they find out that Sam had been in the woods camping with the kids. And so he didn't have cell phone, nothing like that. In 2025, well, in 2024, if you go into the woods, do you have cell service? I know, obviously, in 2001, but when y'all go camping today, is it still no phone? Or do you have like a satellite and then, ciao, it's not for me. But he actually came into the police station himself when he got out of the woods and he saw, you know, all the commotion, all the phone calls, voicemails, all of that. So, of course, you know, they ask him about his whereabouts. He tells detectives he was in the woods with the kids. Not for breakfast. And Sam is answering all of their questions, but he seems to kind of be in a daze. They don't know if he's in shock or what. And he's cooperative. He just seems to be like out of it, like mentally, just unwell. Rightfully so. But... Obviously, they look into Sam, a suspect, because he is the ex-husband and they were just so recently divorced. But where they were in the woods, he pop, he would have had to like wake up the middle of the night, leave the kids in the woods, go murder Dana, and then drive back to the woods. Didn't seem plausible, but not like impossible, you know? And they ask him for DNA and fingerprints. And overall, they just can't pinpoint that ex-husband's vibe but obviously him having a weird vibe in the interrogation room is not abnormal you know what i'm saying so they talk to more people of who would have a better idea of dana's day-to-day -day. they talked to her niece amanda obviously because like i said she spent a lot of time there but she said her aunt didn't have anything you know weird going on that she knew of and Amanda didn't know anybody who would want to do this to her aunt. And then they also talked to the people who called in the welfare check, the family that she would babysit for when she didn't have her triplets. And they said that they were actually so quick to call in a welfare check because Dana had been being stalked by this man that she had met who she wasn't really interested in that wouldn't really take no for an answer. And the family said that Dana had even told her, you know, if I don't come to work, if something happens to me, it was probably him. So obviously this gives detectives a new strong lead and they look into who this man is. So this man's name was Patrick and he worked for the cable company when Dana moved into this new place. You know, after the divorce, he came in and installed her cable and wanted a little bit more, right? Like I said, Dana let him know that she wasn't interested, but he would not stop. He would leave flowers and stuff on her back porch. He was calling her incessantly, stalking, full-blown stalking, okay? And the longer he stalked her and continued to be rejected, the more outrageous the things he was doing would get. First, he was leaving her like, say Shakespearean sonnets, you know, writing nice letters and poems. But then, trying to find my blush, it started getting dark. You know, he started watching her, peeping through the blinds, 
and writing letters about the things she was doing day to day like hey I saw you made tacos last week those are my favorite weird Patrick also had his work van his cable van, cable van that was a white you know work truck it stuck out like a sore thumb and neighbors had reported seeing the van parked behind Dana's house leading up to the murder um, you know they reported that before they even made the Patrick connection but when they looked into him they realized like the white van you know was his that's alarming so they knew who they needed to catch up to next right she had a full-blown peeping Tom in a white creepy van so on September 2nd with the accounts from her friends and family about Patrick um, the sighting of the vans by the neighbors and Dana's phone records showing how many times he had been calling her back to back to back they were able to get a warrant for his DNA and a search warrant for his premises his van all of that and they start that September 2nd and here he does not cooperate he does not want to allow them to search but obviously they have a warrant it doesn't really matter but he is real extremely suspicious when police show up to his door right but they don't tell him exactly what's going on shit i guess they kind of assume that he just knows but when they bring him in to the station because like i said they have the warrant for his dna and all of that girl they tell him what's going on tell him that miss dana has been murdered and he's like whoa listen to me i'm a stalker but a killer hell no okay so he backtracks he does a full 180 he's like you know take my dna search whatever you gotta search like uh oh -uh, no 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 no. i might have been stalking but killer not me and he starts to cooperate with detectives and luckily for patrick he does this 180 he turns things around and he does have an airtight alibi for the time of the murder which is obviously great for him but not so much for detectives who are ruling out you know their best suspects so far and now they kind of need to start from the ground up so the next person they look into is dana's on and off again boyfriend his name is michael and michael lives all the way in canada girl well technically it's not that far from washington but you know across the border they were doing the long distance thing but apparently that wasn't like the issue michael worked in the film industry in canada and he just partied a little bit too hard for dana so she had called things off but detectives know if he was involved in the murder there would be record of him crossing the border so that's good for them and they realized that Michael had tried to cross the border and come into Washington on the night of her death, but he was unsuccessful for some reason, whatever reason, Border Patrol didn't let him cross. And that's an odd quinky dink, right? But Michael says that he and Dana were actually on the phone and she sounded off. And he was concerned he said he was especially concerned because he said i love you when they were getting off the phone and she did not respond so this prompted him to get in his car to come down and see what was going on but he could not cross the border because of an ongoing legal matter he had in canada child i don't know that's what he told police so they're kind of exhausting all their leads everybody has an alibi but they figured dana was murdered by someone that she knew what they decide to do is head to her grave site because apparently at her grave site there was like a little book that you can open up and sign whenever you came for a visit you know writing a little something to the person who was deceased and they figured if she was murdered by someone she knew maybe this person had visited the grave and you know left some type of note or message or apology you know in this little book and the only message that stands out to them is from her niece, Amanda. And in the little book, Amanda had written to her aunt Dana that she wished she had been a better niece. She also wrote that she was 34 days sober. And she had practically been sober since the murder, right? So that was alarming to detectives, especially because they didn't know anything about Amanda being on drugs before. 
Oh my god, I haven't worn lashes in a minute and these are tickling my eyes so bad. But because of this, you know, little entry from Amanda, they decide to talk to her again. And to get a little bit more of a background on who she was, who her friends were, like who these people were that were always in and out of Dana's house. And so Amanda tells them she had definitely fallen in with the wrong crowd. And she was hanging out with this group of, uh, not adults, young adults, like 18, 19, 20-ish, who called themselves the park rats because they would hang out in a city park. Child didn't have much to do, much going on outside of doing drugs and being in trouble with the law and she said that one friend in particular that she had that she was afraid of his name was Blaine and Blaine had attacked her after she didn't want to do things with him and he had kind of put her in this like chicken wing headlock choke out situation similar to what had happened to her aunt and Blaine had also been one of the friends that she had had in and out of her aunt Dana's home. Amanda also said she saw Blaine the day the body was found and that he had some scratches and stuff on his face and chest. And she thought that was odd. And detectives, you know, asked her, well, why didn't you say anything sooner? And she said that she was just afraid of Blaine and that eventually he just kind of up and left Washington. But they look into Blaine and he's got a pretty long violent rap sheet but he is nowhere to be found. And so because they can't catch up to Blaine they decide to talk to other people, other friends and associates, other young adults who consider themselves park rats and um child this is where you are. It gets a little crazy. So when they go talk to other members of the park rats and Blaine's other friends and Amanda's other friends, they say, um, no, Blaine isn't the one who killed Dana, it was Emily. And not only was it Emily who was a close friend of Amanda, but Amanda was there. Amanda watched her aunt be murdered. And detectives are like, I'm sorry. But they know it isn't a lie and it isn't just a story because everybody has the same account. They talk to multiple people. They even go to a prison in Washington where one of Blaine's best friends is being held and he tells the same story. Everybody knew but the police that this Emily person, an acquaintance of Amanda, had killed her aunt while Amanda was there. And they all kind of knew it was Emily, not just because of like word of mouth but even in the news the strange position that Dana's body was found in was like apparently this move that Emily did because she was super strong like putting people in a chicken wing headlock and choking them out was something she did often it was like her signature her party trick and y'all know that this was like 2001 like x-men was really popular and y'all know 2001 x-men was really popular right the first one came out in 2000, like the OG X-Men movies. And so they said that Emily was so damn cock strong, especially when she was on them drugs, that her nickname, they would call her the mutant because she was so freakishly strong. Like it was like a lever move. She would grab one hand, pin you back, and then flip you over her body and choke you out. Wild as fuck. So obviously with everybody having the same story, they decide to bring Emily in for questioning and she's very smug with detectives. And Emily didn't have an alibi. Her only defense was that everybody was lying but her. Everybody but her lying. With everybody, you know, giving the same statement that she was the one who committed the murder and they decide to um, execute a search warrant on Emily's home because if this ain't the icing on the cake, I don't know what is, but as well as people saying that she was the one who committed the murder, they said that Emily was at the funeral and as like a final gotcha, aha, uh -huh, she wore some of the clothing that she took from Dana's home after the murder to the funeral. So they went to the home looking for Dana's belongings. 
in the process of looking for the clothing, they find Emily's journal. And in her journal, she has a bucket list. Um, on this bucket list, killing somebody and getting away with it was number nine on her list. Followed by start a fatty club, whatever that means. Number two, go to Italy. Number one is shrooms. Number two, go to Italy. Number three, Amsterdam. Um, number four, she wanted to record a CD. Number five, name a star after her children. Number six, own a mini horse and lamb. Number seven, go to the Caribbean for a month. Number eight, own a house and condo. And then number nine, kill somebody. Where, that don't even fit. All the other goals are very aspirational outside of shrooms. Also in the journal, she had an entry where she was mad at Amanda. And she said that she could kill Amanda, Amanda and strangle her just like her aunt. Because she was so mad at whatever had happened between the two of them. And by March 13th, 2003, they have enough to indict her for the murder of Dana Lasowski. Yo, yo, yo. What's up? Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. To you. So, because most of this evidence is circumstantial and they're not getting a confession out of Emily, they decide to bring in Amanda and offer her a deal in exchange for her testimony, cooperation, all of those things. Even though she gave them a false lead, child. So this is the story that Amanda gives detectives. She says that they were high on drugs. She says that night of the murder, they were tweaking out, she and Emily, together. And um, they went to Dana's house to ask her for more money so they could buy more drugs. But she says no. Amanda goes on to say that Dana wanted them to leave and that she reached toward Emily to like guide her towards the front door. And this is when Emily put her in that little like wrestling hold, flipped her and started strangling her. But her wrestling move didn't go the way it normally did. She snapped Dana's neck. Dana started gurgling and choking and soon after she was deceased. And Amanda said that she didn't come forward about the murder, not because she was afraid of Emily, but because she didn't want to be dejected by her family. Which I can't even imagine. It's somebody I want to fight for my mama, and I've been wanting to fight this lady for my mama for a long time. Like, I can't imagine nobody putting their hands on my mama or my auntie and me just standing there. Especially if I'm on drugs. Not that I would ever be there. But are we about to tear it down? I'm not about to let this mutant strong wrestling move bitch put their hands on my auntie, but child amanda was not me but because of her cooperation amanda gets off totally scot-free but before they can grow grow to trial go to trial emily takes a plea deal and she gets seven years in prison for the murder of dana seven and probably got out sooner than that ain't that some shit Mm, how are we feeling about this one? As always, let me know your comments, thoughts, and opinions in the comments down below, child. I'm about to head to brunch. I'm going to shut up so I'm not late, and I will see y'all in the next one. Bye.